the Stray Cats were um, all of us were were those guys in school that that did play. We all took lessons. We're all very. Um, we we're in the school band. Um, Brian played uh, um, the baritone horn, which is like a small uh, tuba. Ah. He played cello. I played French horn. Wow. And all of us had the had had our rock and roll instruments on the side. Brian played guitar, Lee played bass, and I played a drum kit. And uh, we were all in varying bands. Lee and I mainly together because we're the same age. Brian was too older than us. Right. Which, like you know, especially with brothers, two years difference now it doesn't mean anything. But when you're 11 and when you're 13, that's when it makes a big difference. Absolutely, yeah. So when we were about it must have been about 17. Brian was about 19. We all were doing the same thing at the same time. Lee, Lee and I were, from my guess, a bit more of a blues background, as much as you, as much as you can be from a blues background in Long Island. <laughs> yeah. We loved uh, um, Muddy Waters and The Wolfman and T-Bone Burnett. And mainly that came through listening to, say, the Beatles and the, uh, the Allman Brothers band, what, uh, who wrote the songs, T- uh, 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 you'd see T-Bone Walker, you would see McKinley Morganfield, who, of course, is Muddy Waters. Like, all these names, Statesboro Blues was um, Willie McTell, you find, and you just seek out the original versions of these songs, and by the time I got to, say, the Beatles and the Stones, and you're checking who's C. Berry, who's C. Perkins, who's E. Cochran, <laughs> yeah. who's uh, who's all these original artists. You start finding out about Roy Orbison, um, Buddy Holly, Gene Vincent, Jerry Lee Lewis. A few of them were on what would have been the oldie station, but it was very much like um, you might hear Blueberry Hill or a few of the um, old doo songs, which we love, but... Um, when we started to hear the original Eddie Cochran and Buddy Holly songs and see there was a group, and then you eventually get led to the original recordings of Elvis Presley on the Sun Sessions, and that's when it really completely kicked in that we should be doing this. No one's doing this. It's the greatest music ever. It's got all the elements that we love. We liked getting tooled up. We liked um, music that was complicated enough, but not quite prog. Yeah, we liked um, playing the blues, but we didn't like it as traditional as, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, something like BB King. We 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 want it to be more rock and roll than that. Yeah. Uh, so rockabilly became the perfect foil for all the things that we wanted. It rocked hard, but it had a swing because we all had studied jazz. It had a rock. It had a swing. You had to be pretty good to play, and it was different. And yeah. you got to dress up along with it. Like we cut all our hair off, had big, big hair cuffs, bowling shirts, pink pink pants, blue suede shoes, the whole thing. This would have been 1979 on the island. Wow. Quite, wow. yeah, quite a sight to behold. And um, we just stuck to our guns, and we just really loved it and played all the traditional rock clubs that the. Um, uh, you know the regular rock bands, either original rock or covers rock songs of the day. So imagine whatever 1978, 79 on Long Island, it would have been Leonard Skinner, the Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Peter Frampton, Doobie Brothers, Allman Brothers. You know all that kind of 70s guitar-driven rock. Clapton. Yeah. So we didn't fall in that category, and yet we weren't punk. Or new wave, so we couldn't play the three places that were for that. We were a completely different thing. So we wound up making our own scene, playing what we would call old man bars. You guys would call them pubs, kind of thing. That they didn't usually have live music, and we had a PA, three amp, two amps, my little drum kit, and we thought that would be a cool thing to just we uh, approach the bartenders, who are usually the the bar owners. We'll pack in the place. We keep the door, uh, bar, we keep the door. And we had a gang of around 100 kids who just loved us and would come to see us play in the garage when we practiced. They weren't rockabilly kids. They were just kids that latched on to us. We were their scene. They were our scene. 
So, um, and they, they just came with us to these various bars that we played. Wow. Yeah. That was our little scene. But we played five days a week, four sets a night. So we got very good at it. Wow. We knew every Buddy Holly song. We knew every Carl Perkins song. We knew every Jerry Lee Lewis song. We knew every Eddie Cochran song. So it was quite a good chance to get good at it. Yeah. And a lot of time on stage, which is mm. what people need really to kind of master the craft, I suppose. Exactly. Um, so, so were you still in school at this point or you just left? Or uh, It was at the very end. I was still in school and leading into when we got out of school. Brian had already left school. Uh, Lee was about to leave and I was about to graduate. So um, we, uh, we did it at night. And then uh, uh, school was very much at, after that because this would have been towards the um, – this would have been 1979 and I had – just finished with school then. Wow. And amazing. And then eventually you made your way over to the UK, I believe, or to England more specifically, or yeah. in London, and kind of yeah. did did the same thing there eventually. And, and you got picked up by Rackwood Label yeah. and, and the rest is history, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. what, what happened in England is we thought it was really cool and we would get, say, NME or six months later kind of thing from some one record store that had that kind of stuff in the city. And they they had an article about Teddy Boys, I think, one time, and we thought, oh, it'd be so cool. So we were expecting everyone to be that way. So we um, made a choice, which I don't know if I'd recommend to anyone else as a plan, but we, um, we sold the equipment, gave up our flat that we had had. That was it. We spent the last few... You know, dollars from the last few gigs to buy a, um, one-way tickets <laughs> and wound up in London. And that was – and it became – well, you said it was a good idea. No, you said it was a good idea. No, you said it was going to be a good idea. <laughs> so became just – I think we had a little bit of money. We somehow got to the middle of the city, which we wouldn't even know where the middle of the city was. And quickly ran out of money at, um, uh, you know, B&Bs kind of thing. And um, – we started sleeping rough, Hyde wow. Park, summertime, nineteen eighty. Wow. Met up with a few people who would who would let us crash, Sid and Nancy style on their on their squat houses, and we just kept going out. Anything that was for free, or someone said said you should tag along to. Nothing too glamorous, but just events in London was you know, London was happening back then. Just walk up and down King's Road or Kensington Market or Camden, just be seen in those places. And we just knocked on enough doors. This lasted about three, three, four or five months. And finally, we got to be fourth on the bill at the, uh, at the Greyhound or the, or the Golden Lion or the, uh, Thomas A. Beckett pub or the <laughs> Marquis or Dingwalls or, um, you know, there was that handful of places that were kind of pub, pub rock places. And, um, we rolled the dice enough times that we were allowed to go on fourth. Like I say, you go on at four o'clock in the afternoon for 20 minutes. And we had been playing quite a lot in New York. We hadn't lost our chops. We were still young. And the people that we had been seeing around were people like Lammy. People like Strummer, Chrissy Hine, um, who was friends with Ray Davies. So uh, all the scenesters from then, uh, Spider f f from the Pogues, uh, a lot of the motorcycle club guys who uh, lived with Lem. Right, okay. And uh, uh, there was a clash of Sex Pistol of Dam, the Pretender, like most of the shows, and – and the few hipsters in London whose job it always was to find the next best thing. Right. After us, there was probably something else two months later. Right. But, um, uh, but at those early shows, it was 20 people, but they were all kind of well known in a funny way. And, um, when they saw us actually play the whole nother story, here's these guys with big mouths and wear pink jackets and who talk, talk a lot. So when they gave us the one, two, three, go. We're standing on the drum. He's playing behind his head. We're spinning the bass. We're jumping into the art. Like, we could do it. Yeah. And that attracted certain attention. By the second, third show, we were packing out these little pubs. And in London, you know, back then, it was a very small place. As big as it is, it was small. So record companies start to hear it. People wanted to uh, to get around it. And Dave Edmonds came. 
Ah. He wanted to produce it. And at the same time, when there was one record company that was particularly into it, they were ready to go. And Edmonds was ready to go. So this would have been in, uh, we got there in June of 1980 and we were in the studio. They got us a little flat to live in, in the studio, found Edmonds, agreed to him. We already had a hundred adventures, um, in December 1980, ready to go. So six months of pretty much living rough and, and we made the first record. We went in the first night, did Runaway Boys with Edmonds. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that just shows that your hard work did pay off eventually. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of other people and bands may have given up before getting to that point. If you, if you oh, were yeah. sleep, sleeping rough for weeks on end and, and stuff like that. <laughs> 